Welcome to a new edition of Are You Live? We are here tonight with, I think, I was thinking about this today, Connor. I think, I think you're my favorite political journalist. Oh, wow. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, even though we're not totally eye to eye, and uh, there's almost always a little something in an art in your articles that bugs me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bugs me in the way meaning that I just don't quite agree with it. But yeah, like, yeah. But first of all, you are interested in all the things I'm interested in. You are concerned about many of the things I'm concerned about, and you are extremely principled, extremely principled in the way that you handle issues. You're very I don't like the word fair. I just think it's a bad word, but like you're very open and you're very, uh, not as willing, you are eager to give all the available sides and airing in your pieces. You're very, you're very good at reporting on all of the actors and letting all the actors in a, in a, in an, on an issue speak in your pieces. Um, you're also probably, probably the most prominent I think this is fair. Is this fair? Civil libertarian journalist going right now? I mean, it's certainly one of them. So um, you're also a very good writer. I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep flattering <laughs> well, you. I won't stop you. I know. Um, and, and you have written several pieces that I have recommended as must reading for people, M absolute must reading over the last several years. Connor Frieders, if you, if you have not, I'm talking to everyone now, if you have not read, um, is the title of it the Imperial Presidency? Is that article that piece? Oh, you know, I don't know. I get confused because sometimes there's like different <laughs> Facebook headlines and <laughs> yeah, web right. headlines, and sometimes they change. So I, I think it know. was yeah. I think if well, if you Google Connor's name and the Imperial Presidency, um, you'll see it is the it is a must read. Like it, I think it might be the most important issue in in American electoral politics governmental politics and i think that is the most important article written on it um about the accumulation of power in the executive to wage war especially and it's just it'll take you 20 minutes or 30 minutes to read i if every american read that i think i said this to you on the podcast actually when i had you on the podcast but if every american had read that we would be a safer much safer healthier country and i would feel much less worried about getting blown up at a moment's notice <laughs> or or having all of russia or all of china blown up at, at a moment's notice which wouldn't be good either for me yeah yeah it seems we're veering toward toward the china version of that and not the right? russia version right yeah i know i know seems like both parties are kind of like moving over to wanting to go to war with china now we can talk about that too if you want but um so recently you've written about a lot of stuff um but uh you had a couple pieces that very recently that I wanted to talk about, although we can talk about anything you want. Uh, one was on civil liberties and the pandemic, which has been a main theme on this show here and should be a theme on every damn political show, if you ask me. <laughs> right. Um, and then you had a, a funny piece, an interesting piece on what you call, what is called Trump derangement syndrome. <laughs> and uh, I definitely want to talk about that too. That's one that I, I disagreed with you more there. Yeah. Uh, and I was like sort of more clear that I was right and you were wrong on that one. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I thought was um, just, it's magnificent. Anything that makes me really think hard and I don't have, I, le I finish the piece not being so sure of my position. That to me is magnificent writing because I run across those pieces very seldom. And this is one, everyone needs to read your recent piece on, uh, I think it's what's it called civil liberties in a pan or something like how to protect civil liberties in a pandemic. Yeah. Sort of, sort of a generic title, by the way, for all you don't know who are not journalists, um, we journalists do not get to choose this is a terrible thing. We do not choose the headlines. A lot of people don't know that the writer does not choose the headline. The editors choose the headline. We have no, almost never do we have a say when we write a piece for a, a publication, do we write the headline? So Connor doesn't write his headlines, but anyway, um, so, it's not a bad headline. It's just a little, it's a little boring, mm -hmm. it's not, but it's not your fault. Um, but it's a fantastic piece. Oh, thank you, Landry. Landry just posted both of them in the chat. Seriously, everyone go read them. Um, take you less than half an hour to get through both of them. Just tremendous survey of these issues that we've been dealing with a lot here on this show. 
And there's my introduction to the great Connor Friedersdorf. So thanks for being here. And why don't we, um, I mean, what do you want to, let me ask you this first, actually. Forget politics for a second here. <laughs> we talked about you being sort of semi-nomadic as, as a result of this pandemic and the lockdown. And I have suffered in various ways and everyone pretty much has suffered in various particular ways. Can you just talk a little bit about your state of mind? Um, yeah, you know, I, I suppose I wish that I could just uh, go to sleep for six months and wake yeah. up and, <laughs> and be that much farther along, uh, kind of having a clear idea of what's going on. Um, yeah. I, I, I've been struggling with how to, how I should be a journalist right now, because yeah. The big story is something that is not in my wheelhouse of expertise. I'm not well versed in epidemiology. Uh, I feel like insofar as I can add value, I can still, I can still spot a bad argument and I yeah. see a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm very puzzled by um, an expectation that a lot of people seem to have that I think is wrong. And that expectation seems to be that we're three or four weeks away from uh, the disappearance of the coronavirus for a while. And then there might be another uptick, another round in the fall during flu season. Mm. Um, and I see this baked into people's expectations, even people who aren't asserting it totally. Like I spent the last few days um, talking to people who run food banks in different states about uh, what they're seeing. And the answer is basically 50 to 70% increase in the amount of people who need to get help getting food for their families. And, um, and so I asked these people, you know, wow, how do you deal with that as an organization? The supply goes up. Are you drawing down, uh, stuff that you've stockpiled or like how does it work and they say well um you know we had some stockpiles and when the catering company shut down they donated a bunch of food and then we're having to purchase food on the open market and one lady told me that she just had like a a four hundred thousand dollar food order and the normal annual budget of her organization is five hundred thousand dollars and i was like well how is this sustainable and they would all kind of talk about how it's sustainable by having this expectation that this all goes back to normal in like a month. Mm. And these are really uh, people who, in everything else they said, they seem to be um, doing smart logistical things uh, under tremendous stress. And I was very impressed talking to them. Mm. Um, and I just think that people are looking at these, uh, all these models and curves, and they all show this exponential growth, and then they show a peak. And then almost every curve you see, if you just go through newspapers or look on Twitter, there's this symmetrical going down on the other end. And I don't understand why that would be so. Um, like, it seems to me that uh, we don't know exactly how many people have been um, affected by this, have been infected with this and not shown symptoms. But it seems like it's definitely less than 25%. That would be like the very, very high end of what I'm seeing. Let's even say 30%. That leaves 70% of the population that hasn't been exposed to this thing that seems to spread very quickly and exponentially when things aren't shut down. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the shutdown we're experiencing right now is um, sustainable. Like whether or not it would be wise to sustain it, uh, nothing that I see around me suggests that people will voluntarily go along with it. I don't mm -hmm. think it can continue if mm -hmm. people aren't mostly voluntarily going along with it. So, yeah, I just kind of feel, uh, I hope that I'm being overly pessimistic, um, but I, I question lots of the things I see around me. And, you know, pr President Trump, um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, I, I don't know, time is kind of uh, hard to tell right now, but yeah. at some point he put down some marker of he thought that there would be 60,000 deaths. Mm. And when he said that, um, I thought, I wonder why he said that. Uh, you have to think that he's saying a number he thinks he'll beat, I guess, insofar as he can be strategic beyond the moment. 
Um, and then this week, he actually said, it looks like we're going to get beyond 60,000 deaths. Actually, I was wrong before. I think it's going to be between 60 and 70. And I'm like, you only bought yourself like another week and a half until your new thing is <laughs> not right. And I don't, like, I just don't get it. Like what? I don't know. Huh. Um, it, it's like, I see a lot of people who are still thinking in terms of winning news cycles when we have this fact of, of death counts that is like just going to happen and cannot be spun or wriggled out of. Um, like there's just going to be video of Trump saying, Oh, it'll be 70,000. And like, we will be at 90,000 then. And I, well, I say that, I don't know. So, um, hmm. so the one piece that I wrote that I, I felt really strongly that I was right about, uh, about this pandemic is about human challenge trials. And I don't know if you've seen anything about these ideas, but it's basically piece. the idea that um, the vaccine process is long for a lot of reasons and a lot of them you can't do anything about. Um, but there's this one piece, this one stage where normally they would give a bunch of people a potential vaccine and give another bunch of people a placebo and then they would send them out into the world and see how they all fared. And um, maybe you could do a different version where if you had people who were willing to volunteer, everyone would get the vaccine and then would get exposed to the pathogen directly to see if they would be, um, uh, to see if it worked, to see if the vaccine worked and that this could speed things along. And maybe it only gives you a day or a week or a month, but um, some evidence suggests you could save a lot of people and a lot of money uh, in a day or a week or a month. And so uh, I, I think the risks of this are very uncertain given what we know now about the disease. I, I think that the people behind the project I wrote about are doing their earnest best to figure them out as best they can and be clear where there's uncertainty. And the thing I feel strongly that I'm right about is that if uh, people want to do this, if they want to volunteer in this way, then the state should not stand in the way. Um, and I was surprised by how many people didn't just disagree with that, but were furious about it and treated it as oh. an abhorrent position to take, um, oh. which maybe I should have expected, but I did not. Oh. And um, it, uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I was surprised by the email on, on that piece. Oh, you got a lot um, of pushback on that. I got a lot of pushback on it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So to be clear, you're talking about people who want to volunteer to basically put themselves at risk uh, in order to develop a vaccine, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're defending their right to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they should be able to volunteer for a human challenge trial. Um, you know, the counter to that is that would not be an ethical um, approach to take for testing a vaccine because um, we don't have any treatment for this right now. We don't know exactly how dangerous it's. The sophisticated version of it is it's so there's so much uncertainty that you can't meaningly have informed consent. Um, and of course I think that okay. people can consent to things with uncertain risks. They do all the time. Sure. Um, but the, um, I, I was, I think I was surprised in part because um, like this is something that a lot of those people who would be volunteering are almost certainly going to get anyway at some point if there's never a vaccine. <laughs> mm. And, um, but, but yeah, the pushback against it was as if I had made kind of the most extreme version of a utilitarian argument. Right. And I was just like, you know, throwing trolleys onto tracks that were killing people before our eyes. And, right. um, and I was kind of like, I think this is really different than me throwing a trolley switch the way you're all reacting. This is saying other people should be able to um, risk, take whatever risk to their lives that they think this is. And, uh, and don't we let people do that all the time? Aren't we in fact letting doctors do that now who are working in emergency rooms? And don't we, aren't we letting soldiers do that all over the world and, and et police. cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, it's hard for me to even steel man that argument. I can't quite, I mean, the, what you said, I guess, is the best possible argument against it, which is that it's 
a lot is unknown about it. Whereas I guess you could argue that there is more known about the dangers of being a soldier in Iraq or a police officer in New York City, I guess. But it's those are still full of variables. I mean, there's no way of knowing exactly what's going to happen to you, even if you're like a combat uh, office a soldier in you know Baghdad in 2004. I mean, even then, it's not definite that you're going to get shot. But I'm I'm that's surprising to me. Um, I wonder if could, did you get a sense of sort of the politics of the people who were pushing back against you? Um, no, other than it was um, the piece seemed to reach people who were not used to arguing about politics. And <laughs> okay, um, yeah. you know, I mean, sometimes sometimes the email I get on a piece, it seems like people who have been reading me or reading the kinds of publications I've written out of my career and are pretty well versed in like that kind of thing and nothing's really surprising them. And this reached a set of people who seemed like, um, like it was shocking to them that the Atlantic was even willing to publish this. Wow. Um, and wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, and you know, maybe uh, people are scared and it's a rough time for everyone. And maybe that is part of the difference of pieces I've written in more normal times when yeah. I just get the normal amount of vitriol. Was it like, was it like they saw the headline and they just thought Tuskegee experiment, Tuskegee experiment. Is that what they thought? Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. And I mean, there definitely is a, um, you know, things like that have definitely given people a heuristic against utilitarian arguments in bioethics. Yeah. And, um, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know enough about it to say any more than that, but I think, um, we're definitely going to see more conflict along those lines as this goes on. So I just had a really funny deja vu moment. Uh, this is this is a propos of nothing. Uh, you, you used the word heuristic, and you used the word heur heuristic in the unregistered uh, interview. About oh, right. I do remember that. You remember yeah. that? About, yeah. about two, this is like, what, at least two years ago when you were on the show. Yeah. And, and I said, I don't know what that means. Can you explain yeah. it to me? So, <laughs> um, so uh, I think there's a decent chance of some people don't know what that means. So what's a heuristic? <laughs> a rule of thumb, let's say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They have this rule of thumb where they're like, uh, I just kind of reflexively distrust a utilitarian arguments in in the medical realm or it's like shorthand is that another way of putting it yeah yeah uh, well it's kind of but it's like not just shorthand it's like a um yeah it really is a rule of thumb just like a, a thing that you oh, right. apply without thinking more okay right right about it as a right, kind right. of blanket um procedure yeah that's interesting so i mean i my my biases, my prejudices would tell me <laughs> with zero evidence, this is just, but my prejudice would say that those people uh, are going to tend to be control freak types. They're going to tend to be the social engineering types. They're going to tend to be the old school progressive types who want an orderly society with no risk, et cetera. Um, and also a nanny state mentality that the government should take care of people like their children. I, I don't know. Did you, is that unfair characterization? Yeah, no, I think that that's probably right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, they're like to put it in, uh, in terms that Jonathan Haidt would use, they care most about care harm Yeah. Uh, in their moral intuitions and they really care about those things and they don't um, see much else going on. Okay, good. I'm glad my prejudices are right. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good all right so you were bumming me out before that though we got to get back to this so um it sounds like what you're saying is that in the big picture mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter too much um who's in government what the governments do that what you're seeing is like the virus is going to do what the virus is going to do and that you're you are predicting is going to be a bad thing almost regardless of what the government does, I guess, unless they impose a total martial law lockdown, right? Is that yeah, I guess, I guess what I think is that, um, I do think that. Which they couldn't do anyway. Right. They, they just, so there's this, there's this, you know, the, the immediate thing that, that, uh, lots of people are arguing and that we ended up doing was the idea of quote unquote flattening the curve. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that, instead of having this immediate peak of all of the COVID cases and they were going to overwhelm hospitals and a lot of people are going to die that, that might not have with better treatment, uh, we're going to push down uh, the peak 
and it's not necessarily going to mean fewer overall cases, uh, but uh, it's going to happen over more time. And um, I am very confident that however long a vaccine takes, I think we're going to know uh, more about how to treat this in six months than we do now. If I knew I was going to be infected with COVID-19, I would much rather have it in six months than have it now because, you know, basically every, um, every country in the world with the capacity to do so is testing every antiviral drug that they have, uh, testing antibody therapy. There's just like too many, um, too many clinical trials going on to count, right? And it seems to be the pattern with viruses that um, we do learn better how to treat them over time and mortality rates go down. You know, we don't have an AIDS vaccine, uh, but it certainly is much different getting AIDS today than it was getting AIDS at the beginning of the epidemic. And it mm -hmm. was different getting AIDS when Andrew Sullivan got it than it was just getting it a few years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I do think that it's pretty safe to assume, even when we don't know much about anything right now, um, treatments are going to improve and death rates are going to go down um, for people that get to the hospital. So, you know, I think it makes, it makes sense to pay attention to the hospital capacity, but I think that um, at the same time, uh, I do think that there's like a, a pervasive illusion out there on one side that we can socially distance forever and on the other side that we can stop now without any huge cost to um, an increase in cases and deaths. And I don't think any of the, either of those is true. Uh, like, I think, I don't even know what, what I think the right amount of time to keep going with the shutdown is, but um, I, I don't think the optimal time will determine what we do. I think the political pressure to reopen is enormous yeah. and maybe that's right. And maybe that's wrong, but like it shall be, it, it, it seems like it's definitely going to happen. It's already happening in some places. That's right. Um, and I hope that what happens is that we open things back up and for the rest of the summer, there's nothing much going on. And, you know, like, but I just don't understand the basis for thinking that that's going to happen. Okay. And, well, here's, here's my basis for thinking that, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, am I wrong that China and South Korea are essentially fully reopened? Uh, well, I don't know about China. Um, well, we had the first, the first edition of RU Live was with, a, with our China correspondent who was reporting from uh, uh, Wuhu, which is near Wuhan, mm -hmm. uh, but kinda, and also near Shanghai. So he's kind of right in the middle of all of it. And he, he's been there, living there for the last seven months. Yeah. And uh, this was, what was this, three weeks ago when we had him on? And he was reporting with video a society that looked totally reopened. I mean, even a lot of people weren't wearing masks in public mm -hmm. in China. And I think it's true that the schools, I know that in South Korea, the schools are open. I know I saw that report last week, uh -huh. which is remarkable. I mean, to reopen the schools demonstrates a whole lot of confidence it that does, yeah. the pandemic is, is gone, essentially, effectively gone in that society. Yeah. And South Korea was slammed pretty hard. I know they had a very vigorous response to it, but mm -hmm. if China is at least largely reopened and South Korea is entirely reopened just a couple of months after they were at the, the epicenter of it, and Italy is starting to, are already considering reopening and they have had the worst cases or worst mm -hmm. uh, numbers for a while there. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know why that's not going to be true here. So, um, I don't know why Italy would have a different experience than we would. Um, and if Italy opens back up and everything seems to be fine, that will definitely change my view of, of how realistic that seems. Um, in Wuhan, my understanding is that the lockdown was both longer and much more strict than the one that we have done. Mm -hmm. Um, that people were basically locked into their apartment buildings that um, insofar as people tested positive, they were brought to a separate facility rather than told to go shelter with their family. Um, and that China, um, you know, imposed pretty, um, uh, what's the word for them? <laughs> Authoritarian measures to keep people from traveling from place to place. Um, and I'm just kind of generally skeptical that I know what's going on there. Okay. Um, mm. uh, I am, I am, I do have faith that South Korea is not 
too egregiously just lying to everyone about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to have much better testing capacity than we do, um, much better ability to, um, and much better ability to contract trace than we do. And the, the kind of hope of, I guess, the progressive side of the political spectrum is that we're going to do something like this Harvard report that came out. I don't know if you saw it, mm -hmm. um, but like, um, you know, Danielle Allen, I think, who I really like a lot. Oh, actually. yes. I saw um, her on, I saw her on Glenn Lowry's show. Yeah. Yeah. She, I think she's generally fantastic. She's involved with it. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, it's a big long report and a bunch of people signed on to it. I think like the New America Foundation and the Scannon and like lots of people have attached their name to it. And the idea is that we test, um, the idea is that we have a phased opening. First, we build up enough testing so that we can test all of the people that are currently in what we call essential industries, right? So um, everyone who walks into a meatpacking plant, everyone who runs a fire department, uh, we're gonna test them all the time. And immediately, if someone is infected, we're gonna isolate them. And once we've done that, we're going to build up testing another degree and test like the next tranche of people. I forget who exactly it is. And then eventually we're going to build up testing by the summer so much that we are testing every American um, once every two weeks, I think it is. Mm. And they call for the creation of a like a, you know, federal pandemic authority board or something in order to mm. administer all of these tests and get them out to the localities where they're needed. And um, I read this and I thought, you know, would this work assuming you could do all of it? Maybe it, it could. Like mm. I, I would see the smarter plan and yet could you do all this? I don't think you possibly could. Like I don't see anything about this nation and <laughs> that right. I've lived in for all these years that suggests to me that anything <laughs> like this is possibly realistic. And maybe I'm wrong about that. I have my, you know, political prejudices and, and I've certainly been wrong about things before. The thing that I would want, if, if you had put me on that board and they were like, we're going in this direction, but please give us input to try and help us go in this direction. The thing I would say is um, figure out how much uh, compliance you need for people to willingly take these tests first whatever percentage you think that is, and then do some polling to see how many people would actually take the test voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, and then pick some place that would be like relatively easy to do this, right? Because like testing people does help and contact tracing does help. So it's not like there's a huge cost to just doing like a pilot where we, you know, Utah, right? Uh, Salt Lake City is kind of the only big area with lots of people and you have a lot of rural places and you have pretty strong social cohesion. So like, if you can't pull it off in Utah, you're in real trouble. If you can pull it off in Utah, <laughs> then like maybe you could pull it off in Mississippi and Alabama. I don't know. Mm, uh, yeah. But like maybe before we invest the $300 billion that you think that this is going to cost, we should do that. We should do like little tests like that because the studies, are, the studies authors argue that $300 billion is nothing compared to the $300 billion every week we're spending during a shutdown. Mm -hmm. And like, okay, I, I see the point, but like we could take $300 billion and spend it on way more clinical trials for a treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of things you could spend $300 billion on to help in various ways. And um, probably we shouldn't spend it on one that like almost definitely won't work. Right. But uh, I don't know. So I need uh, everyone who has a question to raise your hand, please. It's first come, first serve here, so you better do it soon. Uh, the sooner the better for you. We are, Connor and I are both ready for your questions, comments, denunciations. Uh, you can even yell at us maybe, just don't insult us. But raise your hand if you had anything to say. We'd love that. Um, so, okay, here's what I'm going to say in response to all that. Um, so the countries that have recovered quickly and close, almost fully, I suppose, uh, like China, like South Korea, and Italy in the way that it conducted itself, right, were far more authoritarian than the United States has been, right? Yes. 
that's indisputable. And in fact, my parents are living in France right now. And they just told me yesterday that it's, they can't, God, what is it? They got a ticket for 135 euros for driving more than one kilometer from their house. Wow. In the, and they're living in the country. They're living in the countryside, the remote, remote countryside. Yeah. And they said that it would have been double that because there was two of them, but they gave them, they were lenient this time. It would have been, you know, almost 300 euros just for leaving, right. going more than, and they were in their car. So it's very, so um, where, whereas here in this country, we have, there's been this motto and it almost doesn't even matter if, Amer you know, Americans are notoriously politically ignorant as dirt, but so it doesn't even matter if they've heard this motto, although I'm sure most of them have heard it. We have this old motto in this country, which seems very um, uh, appropriate to remember these days. Uh, give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and now, um, if you're right at all, that is essentially what this culture is saying and will say, and, which means that this, if you're right at all, this culture, by going to the beach in masses in hunting, what was it, in Orange County over the weekend, and yeah. uh, Louisiana, I just I texted, I emailed everybody this morning an email blast and I put it on Twitter. You may have seen it. You know, I got a text from a friend in Louisiana who's reporting that there are a bit, that there are restaurants opening on the black market now secretly, uh, violating the order, this, the state, the shelter in place order, et cetera. Um, tells me that Americans are not only willing, but eager to make that trade, you know, death for Liberty. Uh, oh, or I, don't at least, know, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I mean, more death than other places and and more liberty than other places uh right and yeah so, I mean, well yeah I, I agree that that's what our culture is but like the if you're right i mean i if you're not right then they're not choosing that then they're choosing just to be free and there's no i mean that's what most people are doing they're yeah. disputing your claims about right yeah that's what yeah that's that's what i was going to say is that yeah. lots of the people who are going to the beach don't think they're putting themselves at risk and by the way they may not be going to the beach who knows um, right right um it, it's uh, one of the things that I cannot wrap my mind around just, you know, in the way that you look at what different political coalitions do at different moments and see different contradictions. Um, just thinking about the response to 9-11 and the trade-offs with liberty that the uh, like large swaths of the right were willing to make, large swaths of America too, but I think mm -hmm. even more so on the right. Right. And That's, then, uh, yeah. and then seeing mm. the response to this thing that is killing like way more people than that every day. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, mm. I don't know. I, I'm just curious about it. Like, what, what is it? That's when right. You have, when you have an enemy that is other humans instead of a pathogen, why does that so dramatically change the calculus that people make? Because if you would have told them back then. Oh, don't worry. There's only going to be two more 9-11 with, and like only another 6,000 people are going to die. Can you imagine the reaction that you would get to that, right? Yeah. Can you imagine the reaction if on September 12th, you would have stood up and said, come on, way more people die of the flu than this every year. Right. Like Sean Hannity might have personally come to your house and, uh, <laughs> and like, but now there's that whole swath of people and uh, you know, that, that, that kind of contradiction, of course, doesn't help us at all figuring out what the right thing to do now is. But it does suggest to me that something more that than actual trade-offs between liberty and death is like most people are just in one sort of denial or other about what's going on. Yeah, now you made me rethink my whole thesis on this. Uh, but you know what we've done? We've opened up a very interesting, I think maybe even more interesting conversation about sort of the nature of American culture broadly speaking, right? I mean, and, and I have been a professor of American studies <laughs> for decades. And, and this is a fascinating question that I don't really, I'm not sure exactly what I think about it, but it, you're right, the sort of embrace, the not embrace, but the willingness to go along with such things as the Patriot Act yeah. in the face of a much less, a much uh, smaller threat to physical safety, right. That, that would seem to contradict the way a lot of Americans are behaving these days. So I'm not exactly sure how free we are as a culture or how much Americans love their freedom. All right, Wendy, you've had your hand up. I didn't see it, I'm sorry, I didn't scroll up to the top. Go for it. Gotta unmute. 
Someone, wait, wait, you got to unmute Wendy. Landry, can you unmute her or can I unmute her? There you go. Okay, go for it. Uh, hi, first hi. of all, thank you. Um, my question is, I would assume that the people who are most at risk for cat for getting or for having extreme symptoms from coronavirus are going to stay in quarantine no matter what is decided for them. So their lives aren't going to change. Mm. So um, I'm not sure what my question is, but I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, it. Yeah, no, I think that's an outstanding point. Right. I mean, the people who, as you said, the people who are at most at risk, like all the people I know who are most at risk, they're either, you know, over 70 or they have health conditions, pre-existing health conditions are, are hardcore about quarantining. Everybody I know who's over 70 is hardcore about, except my parents, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was good. Well, my, it was not the story of, of my grandparents. Oh, uh, really? Okay. But I know, I know, I do know a lot. Everybody else, every other person I think I know who's over 70 has been very serious about this. So, yeah. Wendy, I guess, are you asking that in a sense that's sort of like saying the, the problem will be taken care of on its own by the. Well, I'm just saying, like, what difference does it really make? Because it's really about yeah. the people who want to go out and live a normal life. So these people that are staying at home because they can't go out, it's pretty awful for them no matter what. Um, but I don't think that it's gonna make their lives any different and they're the ones who, who really were doing this for, so. Right. I think it's a great point. What do you think, Connor? Um, I think uh, there's only some truth to it. I mean, all of these questions are complicated because there's the personal risk that people are taking that they can figure out for themselves, you know, what it means to go out and what risk threshold they're comfortable with. But then there's the, you could spread it to other people. And so I can certainly imagine different scenarios where I would decide it was important for me to go out and do something that carried some degree of risk, but I would then be unwilling to go visit my grandparents or to, um, you know, go interview people at a senior center or something. And um, insofar as, you know, and then there's the, the there's also the question of like, uh, if hospitals are overwhelmed, uh, even if you just feel like you're taking a risk for yourself, there is some downside cost. If you show up at the hospital and then expect treatment, there's this freeloader problem. Um, where it's not as if you can just be like, I'm gonna take my chances and if I die, I die, unless you're like, <laughs> just gonna stay at home and not go to the hospital and expect uh, other people to risk their lives trying to save you. So, um, so there are these wrinkles and um, you know, my hope is just that we get more information about what is actually risky because again, it could be that going to the beach on a sunny day uh, has, relatively little risk and that standing in an elevator with someone is like the riskiest thing you can do. And like, um, so I, I tend to think that I'm most supportive of relatively stricter things without even knowing where exactly my threshold is, uh, the earlier things are and the less information that we have. And, um, I expect to have lots more good information, um, like every week. All right, we're gonna to go to the private session in just a minute. We're gonna take one more question and this is gonna come from someone who describes herself as high risk and she's a friend of mine in Colorado and I know that she is. So Anne, can you- uh, Hi, I think- Hi, yes. go for it. Okay, hi. Yeah, I'm high risk on a few different counts at this point. Um, and, and so Wendy's question or comment is really something I've been thinking about while sitting at home doing little for many weeks. And it's quite interesting because I, I've stayed home since March 13th, except for two trips to the hospital for doctor's appointments. Mm. Um, that's unavoidable. I have an eye condition. I had to see the ophthalmologist. I'm going to go. 
I, it's, it's a really, really tricky thing. Um, and I think my answer as I think about this is that everyone's staying home to just make it, hopefully to just get us over this hurdle sooner so we can go back to normal faster. But I don't know. I mean, as somebody that's high risk, I'm thinking, gosh, am I really going to be at home maybe a year and a half, two years till we have a vaccine that who knows, we might be forced, they might try to force it, who knows how effective it might be if we don't really get antibodies to this. It's just a big mess. So Anne, you're, you're in a especially tricky position because you are, I know two things about you, you are high risk and you're also very committed to individual liberty. Yeah, yeah, it, it's messing with my head, so here yeah. I am. That's a tough one. That's a tough position you're in. I've, how have you thought about balancing those two things or reconciling them? Or are you able to at all? I can't. I Not can't. at all. Mm. I'm struggling. My next door neighbor owns a CrossFit gym. And they said they were going to open yesterday, regardless of what the government governor said. I don't think he did, though. Wow. Because that was closed. But a, a, a gym, that's really pushing it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Connor. But it's so it's so high in Colorado the the corona covid cases. We have so many in our county. It it's almost as much as Denver. Yeah, I know. So, we're obviously not containing it well. Yeah. All right, we're going to have Connor respond uh but uh after I say this. So, if you're watching on YouTube, and you're not a member of Renegade University and you'd like to be a part of RU Lives in the future. And by the way, on Thursday, we're gonna have Alex Epstein, who's gonna blow people's minds in all kinds of ways. Um, go to renegadeuniversity.com and become a member at any level. All right, now we're gonna go to the private session, everyone. One second here. <laughs>